Should we get started? Sure, I'm ready. Thank you. I, th I think we're going to get started. Thank you guys for, for coming. Um, and uh, I, you know, um, I hope this is a kind of compelling hour, hour and a half. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to, to welcome Jeff Day. Jeff is not a stranger to the school in that he's been here for reviews and things. Um, I think many folks in the audience uh, know his, his work. But, um, uh, but this is the first time we've had him come to present his work. where he's been since uh, 2000, 2000, I think. Um, uh, he was the director of architecture programs uh, uh, at that school from 2012 to 2017. Um, he had gone to Harvard as an undergraduate, where he graduated in magna cum laude, but this is just squeaking by. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then the finished, he got his master of architecture degree at UC Berkeley. Um, at, at UNL, um, Jeff also runs something called FAC, the Fabrication and Construction Team, um, which, I, are you going to talk about it? Yeah, I'll, so I'll I'm going to let him explain it, but it's a really <laughs> interesting kind of uh, take on the design build version mm -hmm. of, of education. Um, and he's won a bunch of awards for that. The inaugural 2013 ACSA Design Build Award. It won the Collaborative Practice Award uh, from ACSA in 2016. Um, uh, and I think he's a very accomplished teacher and administrator, um, uh, but, uh, but uh, is also a very accomplished professional. Uh, um, he uh, was a founding principal of Lean Day, Began in 2003, um, and uh, this is an architectural practice at Footprint Omaha in San Francisco, with E.B. Min. Um, it, through that office, he's won more than 85 design awards, um, uh, uh, including some really important ones, like uh, in 2016, uh, you, you were the, or part of the Emerging Voices Award from the Architectural League in New York. Um, they, they were part of Architectural Record Magazine's 2009 uh, Design Vanguard and Residential Architects 2010 Rising Star Award. Um, uh, and in addition to that, uh, they fairly recently, I think, started this uh, uh, line of furniture called Mob. Um, Min Day has, has uh, he's been talking a little bit about this too, but he's, his current firm is now, has kind of transitioned to a different one. It's, it's called the Actual Architecture Company um, and is, is kind of based where he is. Uh, he, uh, let's see, Jeff has a kind of incredible range for his work. Um, I, I've certainly been consistently impressed with the work, um, from like public art installations or signs for, for Cochrane Park that become a meeting place uh, that makes us rethink of what's what's going on, to the Blue Barn Theater Company and Box Track 10, this is a mixed-use cultural uh, center that redefines what a cultural center and urban housing could be, uh, to uh, to compelling mod furniture that's both an invitation to use and a provocation to wonder. He manages to kind of, shall we say, stir a lot of pots and do them all, with, stir them all with a plum. Uh, from the outside looking in, uh, at least from where I sit, it seems that, like, to me that he's able to take any circumstance, any project of any size or, or kind and turn it into something special, something unexpected and extraordinary. That all the work is innovative, it's formally exuberant, it's, it's carefully made, it's thoughtful in form and in construction. And I would say he pushes the boundaries of, of possibility in both form and construction, but, but within the realm of professional acumen. Like it, 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 it appears that he has clients that aren't necessarily coming to him for art, they're coming for shelter and they leave with poetry. And that's kind of amazing. I think he elevates his building programs into dynamic participants in the culture and creates protagonist friction. And with that, please welcome you. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Well, um, that's a wonderful introduction. I hope my lecture doesn't disappoint <laughs> afterwards. But uh, thanks to Kevin and the, and the committee for, for inviting me. Thanks to the dean for supporting uh, the lecture series. And uh, it's really great to be back here, especially uh, while it's still winter in, in Nebraska. Um, I left my coat in my car in a parking garage this morning at uh, 4 a.m. and uh, came for a little bit of summer, which is uh, going to be hard to leave tomorrow. But um, we're, we're, we're closing to the end of that. Um, so I want to begin by talking about, um, about the practice and some, uh, some recent changes and, and then go through uh, some work um, uh, from a, a whole, uh, the whole history of the firm. Um, not every project, so don't worry about that, but, um, but projects from throughout the, the uh, basically 15 years of, of Minde plus uh, some newer work in progress. Um, when we uh, 
when we give lectures about the, the Minday work, we're almost always asked about you know, the, the two offices that the, uh, the two locations of our, our offices, San Francisco uh, and Omaha, which is not a combination that you usually hear about. So San Francisco, um, it's, you know, everyone knows the city, it's, it's urbane, it's, it's very dynamic, it's very expensive, it's, it's a lot of varies and, um, and, and, and very beautiful at, at the same time. Um, but with some very serious uh, urban issues, uh, housing is an a, a, a s- a ongoing problem in San Francisco um, due to cost of living and, and lack of affordable housing, a lot of other challenges in, in that city. Um, and then in uh, the Midwest, in the Great Plains, where, where I'm based, and that's actually from the Denver airport, so it's not quite Omaha, but um, you know, we have very, other very different uh, conditions to deal with, the different obviously different landscape, different economy, uh, and, and I think what this sort of duality brings the firm is an ability to uh, feel confident in addressing a wide range of, of locations and situations, circumstances of practice, um, and, and it allows us to escape the, the particularities of a particular place. Um, I found when I lived in San Francisco and worked there, uh, it, it, it always bothered me that there was a sort of San Francisco style that a lot of architects would, um, would essentially ape without really thinking about it, uncritically sort of applying bay windows to buildings and so on and so forth. And so I think by um, kind of being between places, we're always questioning what it means to be uh, of a particular <coughs> place and how, that rep- how that's represented in, in the work. Um, so we, we operated Minday for 15 years, and um, actually this is the first lecture I've talked about a transition, but we're, we're splitting the office into two separate practices. Um, it's amicable, we're not locking each other out of our offices or anything um, un- unpleasant like that. Uh, but we just felt that the firm has evolved to a point where it really needs to operate um, a little bit more independently in, in, these, in these locations, and um, yet we still plan to collaborate on, on particular projects uh, as, uh, as, as, they, as they are. So um, we're going to be um, Min Design, and uh, based in San Francisco, an actual architecture company based in, uh, in Omaha. And uh, um, right now, actual architecture company, we're working on um, proj- a project in Omaha, which I'll show tonight in progress. Uh, we have a project in northern Nebraska, a project in far western Nebraska, project in Canada, and a project in New Zealand, and a project in Los Angeles. So we're still operating all over the place, despite the fact that we're, uh, we're, we're basically operating out of one office now. Um, and Kevin mentioned FACT, or Fabrication and Construction Team. Um, and actual FACT is sort of uh, amuses me, I don't know. Um, it, it seems appropriate these days to be focusing on things that are somewhat real. Um, <coughs> but. Uh, FACT is, uh, I- in, in a broad sense, it's a design-build uh, studio. Uh, students engage in FACT in a studio, sometimes in a three-credit elective course, through uh, grant funding as paid interns or uh, independent study uh, uh, programs with individual students. Um, I'll talk more about that a little bit later when I get into the projects, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it I'm trying to make FACT uh, a kind of a, uh, a flip side of the actual architecture company that addresses nonprofit projects, everything is pro bono. Um, and it's a way of engaging students in the creative possibilities of making architecture. Generally, students come to FACT when the projects are already in or through schematic design, so they're, they're jumping in immediately into a more design development level of, of resolution on, on the projects. Um, so this is actually part of a FACT project, but the image is, a, is an important touchstone for the practice in that it represents uh, an approach to building that is both uh, dynamic and, and evolving um, and governed both by the, the straightforward practicality of, of the farmer and, and the risky experimentation uh, of, of someone more speculative. Um, and so it's this sort of both and duality of, of thinking about how we can be very uh, sort of uh, specific and, and guided as well as improvisational and loose in a practice. Um, and that's uh, something that accepts both circumstantial um, and happenstance, things that occur in practice, but also um, sort of projective ideas of the ideal that might be manifest from, from very early stages. Um, <coughs> so in some ways, this approach is, is um, 
in contrast to more familiar understandings or tropes of modernism where architecture is seen as a device that uh, essentially isolates subject and object by defining itself in, in its, its autonomy. Um, and the, the white cube notion of an, uh, an art gallery, this is a term uh, coined in 1976 by the critic and artist uh, Brian O'Doherty in, in a book called Inside the White Cube, originally published as an article in Art Forum. Um, but he's writing about the ide ideology of, uh, of gallery spaces, and he traces the development of the white cube, which is familiar to anyone who goes to a contemporary art museum these days, or modern art museum. Um, he traces the development of that form from easel painting, where the easel and then the frame uh, separates the artwork from its surroundings. And so the notion of this gallery is to create a space that isolates the artwork uh, to allow it to sort of uh, operate autonomously without contact to its surroundings. And, and in, in many ways, modern e modernity and modern architecture does the same thing with, with program and space. Um, and it reinforces sort of the object quality of, of architecture as well. Um, and so for us, the, the critique of the white cube is both literal. When we do projects in the arts, we're, we're essentially critiquing that. And, and you'll see some of the examples of ways we've addressed that. Um, but also, it's a way of thinking about how our practice relates to uh, contemporary modernism. Um, so this, this project is a, a part of a, a fact project for Art Farm, which is a 40-acre uh, art facility uh, in, this in central Nebraska. Um, a farmer grew up on this land, inherited it from his parents, and realized he was a terrible farmer. So he decided he'd be an artist and um, started collecting buildings. Um, and bringing them and stacking them up in his, um, in his space on, on his 40-acre property, uh, and then eventually started a nonprofit to invite resident artists to spend time. And it's a rea really interesting kind of art residency because it operates outside of the financial system. Artists are not given any money, but they don't pay any money. The annual budget is about $5,000 for the entire 40-acre property. Um, it's kind of amazing, but everything is salvaged, and um, including structures like this. This barn hadn't been used for about 30 years, and we bought it for $1,000 and spent about $6,000 moving it three miles. Um, and, uh, you know, originally we had designs of with working with students over a couple of years and summers of building a foundation, sort of setting this on, on the ground, um, uh, creating both a storm you know, shelter for the, for the art farm, but also a space uh, uh, that would operate as a, as a gallery. But when we saw the barn floating above the landscape, we were really taken with the idea of this levitating structure. And so we completely revised the design to, to and worked with a structural engineer to levitate it. So it's actually, most of the load of the barn is in the center. Uh, and so that comes down on foundations, but then the outer wings are just on these very thin three inch steel columns that come down to the foundation so that the whole barn can float. And then the gallery inside which is sort of a distorted white cube, operates as a, a way of displaying art, having performances, um, but there's nowhere that you can go and be completely away from this landscape. Um, and so we think about um, you know, trying to create spaces for art and culture that avoid or completely do away with this kind of neutrality that the white cube presents, um, but still operating enough uh, a flexibility that allows for a, a you know, wide range of different art practices. Um, so maybe there's a notion of an open cube, something that's open to its surroundings and its landscape um, and allows the artwork to actually uh, operate in dialogue with, uh, with the place where it's being uh, understood. Um, and so I think that this approach uh, requires, uh, to, to deal with projects like this, requires two opposing mindsets. And we refer to these as the uh, mindset of the farmer and the mindset of the cowboy. Um, so from the farmer, we learn to work within established frameworks to address change with expediency and directness. And then the cowboy teaches us how to speculate, to improvise, take risks, and then to redefine the, the problems that we're presented with. And we believe that embracing both of these tendencies allows the practice to develop a capability to adapt to circumstance um, and to produce work that's both flexible and open-ended and oscillates between both a kind of precise control and controlled imprecision. Um, the art critic Dave Hickey has a sort of similar take. He, he uh, wrote an essay called Pirates and Farmers where he <coughs> sort of separates everybody in the world into one or the other category. But the difference I think in our sense is that uh, we think of farmers and cowboys kind of operating in the same territory but using sort of different approaches. And so 
Uh, it's not a matter of sort of separating people into categories, but finding different ways of operating within uh, opposing mindsets at the same time. Um, this is a screen capture from our, um, our current website. Uh, we actually have another one in, in the works. Uh, this is our second website. But when we built this, and it allowed us to sort of, uh, you know, inadvertently sort of see all of our work at once, we started to recognize something I think that Kevin pointed out, that there's an incredible diversity in the things that we've done. And it's, it's not necessarily by, by plan. Um, when we started the practice with the idea that we'll say yes to any commission or any project that comes along, um, some of them were not maybe the best fit, but uh, for the most part, that approach allowed us to take on things that we might not have uh, we might not have tackled if we set up a practice with a particular kind of project in mind. So people ask us, well, what kind of architecture do you do? Do you do houses? Do you do commercial work? Well, what we do at all. Um, and it's not really about type, it's about approach. Uh, and, that, and I think that's a more important way of thinking about how, how the work maintains that, that kind of diversity. Um, but within the projects, there's, there's, you know, some projects have a more um, very precise kind of control or tight fit to program and and form, and then others are much more loose. The project itself might be loose in terms of contractual arrangements and, and schedules, and the, the use of the project in the end might be very loose. And so I think that there's, those can be seen in, in a variety of different work. So I'm gonna show a number of different projects um, that uh, sort of fit into some of these categories or, or maybe sort of start to evade them. So this is an earlier project uh, in Iowa called the Okaboji House. It's a, fairly large private residence on a lake. Um, it's about three hours from Omaha and three hours from Minneapolis, so it's, and about three hours from Des Moines, so it's popular for people in this region to go um, for vacations. There aren't very many deep water natural lakes in, in Nebraska. Most of the lakes are created by developers to increase property value, and this is actually a real glacial lake. Um, I'm from New England, and so when I think of lakes, I think of wooded lakes with a couple of houses here and there and beautiful place. And we went here and it was basically a suburb um, surrounding a nice lake where property sells for $1,000 per inch of lakefront. So this was about 120 feet, so over you know, a million and two to, to buy uh, property. So it's in incredibly expensive. Um, but then if you sort of look at the map, um, the, the expensive property is only right around here. You go about 300 yards and then you're in cornfield. So it's, and then it's like that till Omaha for three hours. So it's a really sort of intense veneer of, of, of high value property on this lake. Um, but you know, it's noisy, there's you know, houses really jammed in, the setbacks are only five feet, so the houses are really close together. Um, our clients have been going here for a long time and, and renting houses and so on and they, finally acquired this property. And so our first approach was to try to strip out the middle ground and just look at you know, the trees and the landscape and then the lake beyond. And so the house itself operates as a kind of viewing device or a sort of blinder uh, to you know, obscure uh, this sort of context and allow the owners to, you know, they drive or you know, sometimes fly from Omaha and then to get to this house and then just be at the lake. Um, the house is fairly large, about 6,000 square feet, including a lower level. Um, and it cantilevers out on three sides in order to get closer to trees without disturbing the root system. So we've got eight foot cantilevers that are just above the ground. So it's just sort of floating just above the grade. Um, but then internally, the spaces uh, sort of compose into these major public areas that focus views on the lake or back into the forest uh, and the cornfields. Um, on the ground floor, sort of a more amorphous open space. So as you get to the edge of the lake, you're, you've got this wonderful view. Um, in this big open space. And then on the upper levels, these sort of things we call view tubes, these spaces that are open on the two ends but closed on the sides. Uh, and in some cases, allow views through. Um, so as one approaches the house, um, go around the garage, you come through. The first time you see the lake is actually through the front door, just this little sliver of a view. Um, you get into the kitchen, there's a shaft. There's no, uh, the neighbor is only about 10 feet outside of that wall. so. We didn't have a kitchen window, but a, a 10 foot skylight above the kitchen on the second floor. Uh, so you could just look at the sky. Um, but as you can see from the section, the landscape and the, it is completely open. The, the house is all glass on one side and very dense on, on the other. But then the interiors um, are, are treated in a very different way so that the, the larger spaces are really about the views. And then as you get into more and more intimate spaces, they become much more about their own interiority and 
Um, we start to work with, with color in a very intense way um, and developed a color palette for the house. Um, they had three kids. We gave them the smallest bedrooms allowed by code so that they wouldn't hang out in their bedroom very much or come out. Um, but then the kids could pick from the color palette and, and choose the color for the room. There's six bathrooms, and these are four of them. They're all different colors. Um, so you can see you get into these intimate spaces, and, and they become very much about interiority. Um, there's a few moments where uh, we did some things that um, maybe deviated from the norms in the house, and the master bedroom on the second level is one of those where uh, we, we built a, a custom cabinet here out of Baltic Birch plywood. It's um, uh, created with a, a Maya animation that we experimented with to get the, the ripple to be just right, and then uh, milled it at a, a cabinet maker shop on a weekend in Omaha. So it's six feet tall by 11 feet wide. Um, and it's two feet deep, so the slab is, uh, th that's milled is about two inches thick, and then the back is a, is a cabinet from the same material. Um, and then, you, as you can see, there's a bed also made from that material. And so this sort of floats um, in the room, and it's the division between sort of public area and the, and the master bedroom. Um, we also started designing furniture for this house, and so this is really the beginning of the furniture line. Um, we, uh, we had to take down two trees on the property uh, that were, um, that were in, in bad shape, and so we, we harvested some of the oak to make this table, and then we made another table. We had to purchase uh, oak for that one, but um, this one weighs about 300 pounds. It's actually a little bit hollow in the middle, but it's, it's mostly solid oak. It's four feet by four feet, um, and, uh, and, and built both of them built by a, a craftsperson in Omaha who um, we worked with for, for several years on a number of different pieces. So. You know, working on houses like that started to uh, give us opportunities to work on smaller scale projects, sometimes within the, as, as built in, sometimes uh, furniture, so the specialized pieces of the project. This is a, a residence in Chicago uh, where we did, uh, it was actually a, a remodel of a spec home that had very little character. So we did, without moving windows or structural walls, a uh, tremendous <coughs> amount of cabinetry work and, and some custom furniture. So this is a piece that is part of our furniture line. It's called the 345 table um, because it's three pieces. The bottoms are square, four-sided um, sections, and the top are five-sided, and then it's triangulated to, to match that. So it's, it's one of the categories of pieces that we do that are very finite. They only fit together one way and then break up and can be moved around uh, in, in the room. This is called the Dr. No uh, cabinet, um, and it's, uh, it's built around a chimney flue, so that's why it's inflecting. There's a window here, the neighbor is 30 inches away in Chicago with these tiny little alleys. So it's just a way of letting in some light. But there's a little button right underneath the, right underneath, um, right here. And then a motor, I don't have a video, drops down a liquor cabinet. So you can make your, uh, your martinis um, with, uh, with, with the flip of a button. Um, many parts of this house have little details like this. Like in the master bedroom, there's a, a hidden desk that allows you to leave your desk messy and just, just shut it up at the end of the end of the day or when you're entertaining. Um, and so these things, I mean, I've, you know, we've done this kind of work in, on many different projects where these little moments allow, I mean, it allows us a chance to sort of experiment. Um, but they build in places where the, the inhabitants get to really interact with their, with their architecture in a, in a very direct uh, and, and somewhat fun way. Um, and so that's really the sort of beginning of this furniture line uh, called Mod, where uh, we've developed these pieces that are uh, essentially sort of um, instigators for improvisation. They allow people to sort of modify spaces uh, and encourage them to do that. So this is one piece called the Stones Table uh, that breaks up, as you can see, into uh, a number of different components and then comes back together into a, a nice clean rectangle. So Mod is the, is the furniture line. Um, and we're, we're still developing some pieces uh, within that uh, right now. Um, <coughs> this is one piece that uh, is still in the work. It's actually available to be purchased, but we're still developing some uh, aspects of it. It's called AVA, uh, and it's a display system. Um, it's a, a particular sort of uh, distorted cube geometry that allows, uh, because of its 60-degree angles, it allows for a series of different um, positions and it, as it rotates. Uh, so you would buy one of these and then, you know, stack them up. So in this case, it's a piece that, unlike the three, four, five table or the stones table, which are finite, this can be purchased and then, uh, you know, 
put together in a, in a, a wide variety of different ways to create a, a display system. Um, and we were uh, developing it. One of the things that was a challenge was how do you hold it together? We didn't want to have you know, screw holes or tap holes so that you could you know, attach it with machine screws. So we found these really small rare earth magnets and, and had, uh, I don't have an image of it, but little felt sleeves built for them. So you put the magnets down and then it holds it together. Uh, as long as you don't put your finger in there and put it on it because the magnets will jam your finger and you'll get a blister, that, which I've found out a few times. Um, you know, or the piece can be used just to, you know, as a, a small uh, side table, something like that. And it's made out of 10-gauge uh, uh, steel um, with just two welds. So it's, it's broken um, and, and then welded together and, and, and powder coated. So you don't have any sense of its real uh, construction. Um, so jumping in scales, um, the Bemis Center for Contemporary Art is actually the first FAC project. Um, and we've worked with the Bemis Center over the years. We're actually going to do another project with them next fall. Um, and here, you know, the previous projects were very much about this notion of a tight fit, uh, really sort of precise uh, control over uh, design and construction. Uh, and here we're talking about a project that's extremely loose. Um, we started with a master plan, and uh, the project has evolved you know, numerous times uh, since uh, maybe 2003 when we really got going on it. Uh, so the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts is a, an art residency program. It's about 35 to 40 years old now. Uh, in Omaha, artists uh, from all over the world come for residences, uh, residencies that last about three months. Um, they're given a stipend. They're given a studio to work in and, and really great facilities right in the heart of downtown Omaha. And the, the building is used in many ways as a laboratory for artists. So literally, they work on the building. This was a, a project that the Bemis Center commissioned from an artist named Michael Jones McKean, who built a, 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 an artificial rainbow on the roof um, with a harvested rainwater. So um, they got these tanks, about 100,000 gallons of, of tanks, harvested rainwater from the roof. We get a number of thunderstorms and a lot of rain in the spring. Um, and then installed these six nozzles on the roof to spray a certain uh, dimension, I mean, we actually worked with an uh, atmospheric scientist to develop the exact droplet size that you need to create a rainbow um, in the proximity to the, to the viewer. Um, just a, a diagram that one of the, the fact students created. As you can see, pipes kind of moving through the building. The whole building is start, starts to become a machine uh, for this particular artwork. And that was a temporary installation for a summer. And I think it's going to be installed in San Francisco at the San Francisco Art Institute in the near future. Um, but our project really began with a master plan. Uh, the Bemis had, uh, has this five-story structure, um, about 120,000 square feet, and they only used two floors of it when we started. And so we were looking at the upper levels and basement and, uh, and then also reconfiguring the main floor, which is gallery space. Um, over the years, we started to modify and move walls in the galleries to open them up. This is sort of a midway diagram. Uh, and then with the students, um, built and uh, designed and built three different installations that are, are permanent parts of the building. One of the creative parts about working with the Bemis uh, during these years um, was the way they funded these projects. To avoid going for a capital campaign and having to involve the board, they used exhibition funds to build these projects. So we actually called them exhibitions, even though they're modifications to the building. So it was a way to kind of sneak in capital projects into a, uh, uh, an institution that really doesn't have a budget for that. One of the main things that we um, identified in the master plan was the lack of uh, sort of public interaction space at the, at the front of the building. So the, the info shop here is essentially um, a reception area or uh, a social area um, and a place that is not about art, but it's about uh, transitioning the public from the city into uh, the gallery space. Um, so we essentially carved out this section of a gallery and, and gave it over to the info shop. So during the day, it's, it's the reception desk. In the previous image you saw with the, the crowd in there, the desk turns into a bar and, and operates as uh, sort of a the social center of, uh, of the institution. Um, so this was a project uh, done in one semester by fact students and then a summer to build with this. And then this was another year of uh, a soft version of the stones table that fits into the corner. Um, all of this is working off of a, a, a particular uh, 
aperiodic tiling pattern, a pinwheel aperiodic tiling pattern, which uses this particular triangle. And it's a fractal pattern, so you can um, essentially scale it either way infinitely. So playing with that, uh, developing the form, we sort of selected an area of the pattern here. And then the red lines would actually become the inflection points uh, on the wall. And then with a, a grasshopper strip, sort of identified a sort of heat points within this that allowed us to make selections for where the triangles start to sort of change in scale. And then that's all routed out of uh, MDF uh, and painted. Um, and so the, the larger joints are actually joints between pieces and the smaller uh, joints here are actually just routes in the surface. Um, and so this gives a sense of how the flat surface inflects into sort of 2.5D for this wall and then fully into 3D as an as an sort of explosion of that into um, the desk form. Uh, and then here's a view. You can see how the, it bends around the corner. There's hidden doors in there and, and so on. And so students did all of the construction on this. Um, we, uh, the one of the tr trickier parts is really building walls to deal with the tolerance of the CNC routed uh, panels. One of the things that we really uh, started to explore here was the difference in tolerance that one has to address in digital fabrication versus uh, sort of site-based construction, where we're in a 100-year-old building where the floor changes you know, by two inches between each column bay, yet we're coming in with something that is built at a thousandth to uh, you know, th thousandth of an inch tolerance. And so trying to mitigate those differences was a, an interesting challenge from a, a design standpoint. Um, so in, in we have a router at school. This is not the router at school, but we um, we we had we found we had to m to route about 38 sheets of MDF, and I really wasn't interested in my students standing by a router all semester routing. I mean, it's more for them to design the work and then understand, make prototypes, but not to actually sit there and just do production. Um, so we worked with a local state prison. Um, I'm not allowed to show pictures of the actual inmates because of state law. So this is going to stand in for uh, the Lincoln Correctional Center, which is a medium security prison in Lincoln that has a workforce development program with a really pretty substantial cabinet shop. Um, and so we did go have a visit, which was quite interesting. Everyone had to have a background check and get patted down and all of that, and then walk through the prison. Nothing happened to anybody. But um, we found that we, uh, we really wanted skilled inmates working on this because it's a pretty different thing than they're used to. So we were looking for people who'd worked in the shop for a long time. And then finally we left and we were like, wait a minute, we're asking for people who've been in jail for 10 years, which means they probably did something pretty horrendous. Uh, and those are our collaborators. So um, we've worked now worked with the, uh, the prison on three different projects. Um, and uh, it's been a, a really interesting experience to, for the students, but also just to start working with the inmates. And they're really thrilled to be working on, uh, on projects that are not off of, uh, you know, office furniture for state office buildings, which is typically what they're, what they're doing. Um, the inmates couldn't help us do the installation, so the students had to do all of that work um, on site and um, obeying all the OSHA rules, of course, and um, <laughs> safety first here. Um, uh, they did all the finishing, the installation of the panels, painting, and, and so on and so forth. And so this, is, uh, this was in 2010 that this was completed, and it's still, um, still working pretty well. A um, year after that, we, we started working on an outdoor space associated with that uh, info shop. And we did this in a very different way. We, uh, we held a series of charrettes over a summer in the gallery. So the gallery is converted into a, a studio space, an exhibition um, about uh, urban rainwater. Uh, a number of landscape architects and artists were involved in this. Um, and we had 12 charrettes. Uh, when the pub each charrette was run by a different artist or invited landscape architect or architect. Um, you know, just discussions in the gallery. And then at the end of that, we would, the students would work for a week developing ideas that came out of those discussions, and then another round would happen the next, uh, the next week. Uh, and so at the end of this phase, a design evolved, and, uh, and we built it in about three weeks um, as a, a sort of a little rainwater garden in the center of uh, their, their loading dock um, with native plants and, um, you know, uh, salvage materials. This is, this is recycled auto glass with glow-in-the-dark little pebbles in it so that at night the whole thing sparkles. Um, <coughs> so I think, you know, I, I, I call this the, the project with the most conversation per square foot of any building I've ever worked on with the 12 charrettes. 
Um, but it was a it was a it was a great way to involve the public in in these kind of dialogues. Um, other projects, I'm not going to get into all of them, but this one was uh, a, a project for a gallery that was being converted into an event space. So it's a, an acoustical baffle that operates as a light fixture. Um, and we were able to build this for about $1,500, uh, which was a, a, a nice uh, benefit for the, for the Arts Center. Um, and, and built it, designed to build for use in about six weeks. Um, and it operates now, there used to be a wall here and we've taken that out, so it's now <coughs> operating sort of in the, uh, in the open. Um, but we refer to these kinds of projects as subspaces. They're sort of between furniture and architecture and it's a, an area that we've been uh, interested in for quite a while. And uh, this, this pro next project is a sort of an example of that. It's a freestanding structure um, that fits within uh, a room. It, uh, it evolved from uh, a commission we had at Santa Clara University in, in California to design a multi-faith chapel um, at the, this Jesuit University of Santa Clara, um, a space that um, couldn't have any iconography. It had to sort of operate for students of all faiths and different groups could rent it or just sign it out and use it as a meeting space. Um, it's in a historic building on the campus, so the structure couldn't physically alter the building in any way, it had to be freestanding. Um, including had to be, uh, you know, seismically um, stable with and, and still be freestanding. Um, and so we started looking at the geometry of the room, and it's basically just a rectangle, and then thinking about um, sort of Baroque ideas of the ellipse um, and trying to transition that form from a rectangle to the ellipse. Um, but what was really fascinating to us was not so much the form as the way we wanted to build this. We, we felt that uh, because it had to be freestanding, we didn't really want to to uh, use any kind of fasteners. We actually got into the idea of a, a cable tensioned wood structure where there's no fasteners holding any of it together except for tension cables that are held in uh, between a steel uh, base and a steel ring at the, at the top. Um, this is just a, a model that we made just to trying to explore the, the geometry. Um, the project ended up being canceled because of changing priorities at the university. They actually decided to build a new building for this chapel and, and it went to a different architect, so there, they didn't have any need for, for our, our interior. So we had an opportunity at a, a gallery in Omaha to build um, essentially a proof of concept of this idea, um, working with the same engineers. Um, so in this case, it's, uh, it's a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot tall uh, structure um, with a, a seven foot uh, diameter circle at the top. Um, and so if you think of the transition of the square to the circle, it's a rule geometry. Each of those red lines becomes a cable in the ultimate design. The twist, by twisting at 30 degrees, you start to get some real dynamism in the, in the form. And then as you can see, that dynamism starts to be very legible in the way uh, the wood members uh, start to move around as they transition from the square to the circle. Um, a gap, a couple of cables left out and some wood left out that creates an opening to get to the inside. Um, and there's, uh, there's the form. So um, clearly it's a fairly complex thing to, to develop. We, uh, here's the obligatory grasshopper image. Um, that <laughs> uh, but it was a, a grasshopper model that we were trying to optimize uh, the number of pieces. The more pieces we had, the more fine, the fine, more, uh, you know, tight resolution we could get out of the form, um, but obviously the more parts we had, the more complex construction would, would end up being. So we settled on uh, on these 10 different shapes and then modified some of them with what we call twigs, these additional sort of projections f uh, of the wood. Um, ultimately, when it's put together, it's simply a matter of stacking the wood pieces around the cable uh, in the right place using these maps. So we had a printout of all these maps uh, and then just took our time uh, installing those. And um, So one of the things with the cable tension uh, structure, because there's nothing holding it up as you start, um, we, we got interested in the idea of the, the sort of medieval and renaissance false work for construction. Uh, and we, uh, working with our engineer, we, we originally wanted to use a rented scaffold but ended up just using four by four timbers uh, in order to hold the steel ring up and then you could tension the cables and then stack the lumber and then dismantle the, the false work and take it out and the whole thing stays up. So this is a, a video 
which I might skip through in a couple parts that shows the, the system. So this is, you can see the black steel ring at the base of the four by four wide flange and then uh, the, the false work going up and then the cables, the fittings at the end so that they can be tensioned at one end. Um, and then just a matter of stacking the, the lumber. It took about three hours to stack all the, the wood. Um, there were some other things happening in the foreground and some electricians show up at some point during this video so it looks a little busier than it really is. And almost there. So then it's just sort of moving through the interior. So on in the inside there's a, the, the there's a different strip that generated the location of the twigs so that they get denser as you move up to the form. And then, as you can see, the, the form starts to really sort of appear as a, a sort of revolution at the top. What's really interesting is because none of the wood is held together, you can move individual pieces. You can grab it and, and you know, wiggle it back and forth. But if you run into the form, it absolutely holds together. It doesn't move at all, which is, is really quite fascinating. We were a little worried that the whole thing would fall apart or it would the cables would untwist it, but friction does a lot of things for us. So it's something that we're interested in exploring further. I mean, we're, we actually have the next project is a project that's going to use cross laminated timber and, and glue lamb uh, construction, but uh, we're interested in the notion of finding ways of building with wood that uh, get away from either fasteners or adhesives or, or other standard um, modes of, uh, of assembly. So here, this is a project that we're working on actively right now. It's a, a project in North Omaha uh, and we're collaborating with SOIL uh, on this um, project as sort of joint architects. Um, it's funded by an NEA Our Town grant. And uh, so the first phase of the grant funds up through schematic design. And then the project will have to be fundraised and, uh, and then we'll move on. Um, it's uh, an I part of an interest of ours that's been growing recently in, in finding ways of doing um, you know, projects that, uh, sort of cultural projects that become a kind of vehicle for positive social change in, in difficult neighborhoods where community buildings are really actively building communities. Uh, this is North Omaha, which is uh, an impoverished part of Omaha. One of the statistics that uh, I find kind of amazing about Omaha, it has the highest per capita number of millionaires in the United States, but the highest percentage of black children in poverty in, in this particular part of the city. So there's real disparity between you know Warren Buffett's house down the street and and then this um, similar to Detroit there's a tremendous amount of vacancy in in the neighborhood um, this institution here is is the Union for Contemporary Art it's a, a project that was recently completed uh, about a year ago uh, the Union is a, a, a neighborhood based uh, arts organization they have residence space for artists they have a lot of community workshops and um, really actively involved in the, in the neighborhood and they um, they got an NEA grant to develop the property adjacent to it as a uh, residence for artists as well as workspace and uh, a number of other functions. Um, we got the commission. Um, it includes a building here, a historic uh, lounge that was uh, a jazz club where people like Thelonious Monk and others would play when they, they moved through Omaha, which had a very vibrant jazz scene a number of years ago. Um, but given this is an NEA grant, it involves a lot of uh, public interaction and um, public process. So we had a series of workshops through the fall. This was the first one where about 100 people came to the site. We put up a tent, had barbecue music, and had a, an initial visioning session for the neighborhood. Uh, and then a series of artist-led workshops where we worked with uh, local artists, um, potential residents actually, who um, could help us develop a program for the relation, really trying to explore the relationship between uh, residential space and workspace for, for artists and, and understand their needs. Um, and <coughs> part of that involves a sort of exploration of, of uh, you know, the wide range of possible live-work opportunities for, for artists. So this is Donald Judd's Spring Street residence in the 1970s where you can't separate living from art collecting from art making. I mean, he's got John Chamberlain on the wall, you know, the family sleeping here, this and that. I mean, it's, it's everything is together and it's completely mixed up. The alternative is sort of separate studio spaces. This is at the Bema Center, one of the spaces that we designed uh, for, for resident artists. Um, they can live there, they don't have to, um, but living 
infrastructure is consolidated into that box to free up the space. And then one of the things that Bemis is interested in is, is allowing the artist to create their own environment. So an artist arrives at an empty space, then they can go up to a floor which is full filled with furniture, bring that down, and then the space starts to take on character because of the inhabitation of the artist. Um, but one of the other things that we talked with artists about was the, you know, wh where shared opportunities exist within the program, um, large-scale sculpture spaces or paint booths, things that you don't really have the ability as an individual artist to afford or, or uh, the, the, the possibility of installing in your own space, but might be useful shared space. And so that became another aspect of the program along with uh, commercial spaces. So the site is um, an empty lot, or actually two empty lots plus the showcase building. This building right here uh, is in pretty bad shape, but it's on the National Register. It's, a, it's an old telephone exchange. For a number of years, it was the Great Plains Black History Museum. The museum moved out and would like to move back in, and that could end up being another part of our project. And of course, this is the, the Union for Contemporary Art, which is uh, part of the, of the project in a way. So um, our first move was really to define two buildings after a, a process that made the most sense to leave an open space in the center, uh, and then inflect those buildings to allow people to move into the, into the central space, which becomes more of a, a space for the community. Um, but we're really interested in this idea of trying to change the language about open space in a neighborhood like this, where open space is seen as a sign of dereliction or social problems, to try to make open space a positive thing for the neighborhood. So this, this is actually an enclosed atrium inside the Union, uh, and then that's an open uh, garden between the Union and the showcase that was, in, that was developed um, uh, and restored more recently uh, by, uh, by the construction of the Union. And then the project starts to develop more examples of this, tight sort of atrium-like spaces, a private courtyard, and then the sort of public uh, open courtyard space between our two buildings. And then thinking about how the buildings start to bifurcate into two different sides, essentially a double loaded corridor, uh, and how that can start to define the project not so much about as one building or another building, but these two and their shared space, these two and their shared space, to try to create the courtyard as a, as a sort of foreground within, um, within the project. Uh, and then lastly, a connection through that links all of those projects together um, through the interior of the building. And so the whole property, including um, the Union and the Webster Exchange Building and the showcase here, becomes part of a gradient of, of uh, public and private workspace, a sort of cultural campus. Uh, this is an earlier view of a five-story building and a three-story building. There's the showcase and the Webster Exchange. Um, and then the current uh, ground floor plan where you can see the link between all of those spaces. There's retail base here, the showcase, which will be restored as a lounge a small recording studio, um, either a tenant space or if the Great Plains Black History Museum comes back, that'll become the lobby for the museum circulation and then large shared uh, art studio spaces. They could be subdivided but won't be uh, initially. And then upper levels, um, they alternate between residential floors that are eight feet tall and studio floors that are about 11 feet tall. So this is a typical studio floor with different size studios, and then uh, again, a range of apartments from efficiencies to one bedroom uh, units. In, some, in one case, it's maybe a two bedroom. Uh, but all of it works on a 10-foot grid, um, and uh, the structural system will be, <coughs> excuse me, blue lamb beams, uh, and then a, a sort of composite CLT uh, concrete topping slab floor um, on, on all levels of the building. And then potentially, um, our chances of building it in CLT are better given the recent um, tariff on steel, which is driving steel costs up. So thanks to Trump for helping our project. Um, and, uh, but joking aside, I think what we're, we're really looking forward to trying to develop these kinds of spaces where the artists use them as workspaces, but the community can come together. They do a lot of community activities uh, right now in the neighborhood, and this becomes a, a maybe a hub for those. Um, another similar but completely different context, This I'm not going to show this project, um, but I'm, I'm bringing it just because some of you might know Mel Ziegler, an artist who taught here for about 10 years in the, in the sculpture department. Um, uh, we're working with Mel, this is a fact project, uh, this semester as the, the first semester of working with him. Um, he bought a, a, a small 900 acre ranch in western Nebraska uh, next to 
you know, 10,000, 40,000 acre ranches. So it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little place. And then he also bought, um, he bought this building, which is a 1950s grocery store. And uh, FACT is working on this right now to develop that into a community uh, meeting space slash, uh, you know, exhibition place. Um, and I just found out today that Mel might be able to buy that building, which will become uh, an adjunct to that and maybe another residence for, for visiting artists. We actually have a tower that we're building, a four-story tower that will be uh, an apartment and then a sort of viewing place and a sort of signifier uh, to kind of end the, this, this little downtown. It's a town of about um, maybe 800 people um, in far western Nebraska, about six and a half hours from, from Lincoln. Uh, but working with Mel, it's, it's really a, a project where um, it's about bringing artists to this ranching community and engaging the artists with, um, with the community. So artists have to come, uh, the invited artists have to uh, spend three visits, I guess, going to uh, Rushville and, and meeting people in the community before they even propose a project and then develop a project uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the ranchers or, or people in the town. And this is about 20 miles south of the Pine Ridge uh, Reservation, which is a pretty notorious place uh, um, where Wounded Knee is and a number of other uh, sort of significant um, Native American uh, locations in, in, in history. Um, so I want to end uh, by presenting the, this project for the Blue Barn Theater um, in Omaha, which was completed in, in 2015. Um, it's actually a, uh, it's, it's three projects in one, uh, operating as a, as a kind of urban uh, development on a half of a city block. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's again guided by this notion of trying to build communities with, with cultural institutions. Uh, here's uh, the site. This is a post office, um, main sort of post office in, in the city. Uh, train station here that was converted into a television station. Uh, this building is now, uh, will be since our project is complete, is now uh, a co-working uh, office space. As you can see, there's sort of a mix of in light industrial and then residential. This is a neighborhood called Little Italy. And then just north of the railroad tracks is the downtown warehouse district and entertainment district in, in Omaha. Um, and so as I said, our project is three in one. So there's the Blue Barn Theater here that anchors the corner uh, and is really the instigator for the project. There's a project called uh, Bach Carten, which is a mixed-use building with a restaurant and three apartments and parking. And then a small uh, open space, privately owned uh, public space uh, that was originally called Green in the City that is uh, now, um, I'll, I'll explain that in a moment, but it's, uh, it's owned by the Blue Barn, but it becomes a public park uh, that's used for, for Blue Barn events. And so um, kind of jumping back to where I began, the notion of the, the sort of neutral white cube, the, the the theater version of this is the is the black box that you're probably familiar with. Uh, and the black box theater originated um, with artists in Minneapolis, Dallas, and, and Washington, D.C. respectively. So Tyrone Guthrie in, in Minneapolis, Margot Jones in Dallas, and uh, Zelda Ficklander in, in Washington created these spaces trying to get away from the two-dimensional proscenium frame, um, so traditional theater type, to create something that's more like where the uh, more like a Greek theater where the audience and the and the actors engage in the same space. Um, <coughs> so Peter Brook, uh, you know, wrote about this idea um, and really kind of instigated it in some ways through uh, his book *The Empty Space*, which was multi essentially arguing that uh, what theater really needs is an interaction between a text, an actor, and an audience member. It's not about the particular kind of space. But that said, the, 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 the act of theater and the space in which it happens are inextricably linked, whether it's an impromptu piece put in a space like this or a purpose-built theater. Um, Joshua Dax is a, a, a theater consultant um, who um, works in, out of New York but works all over the world, probably one of the top five theater consultants. Fisher Dax is the, is the company. Um, wrote about this, this transition from the ideal of the black box to its ultimate neutrality, which uh, he argues is really sort of going beyond what Peter Brook was originally intending. Um, so the notion of flexibility and in, you know, intimacy in theater became uh, you know, the black box that we all know as being an incredibly neutral, uh, placeless kind of theater space. Um, and so in a sense, he says that this neutrality is really contradictory to these 
these ideas and that there really isn't anything neutral about a black space, which is in, uh, exactly what uh, uh, Doherty was writing about in the, uh, about the white cube. So um, uh, Joshua Dax inspired the, the director of the Blue Barn Theater to build this new building, um, and she ended up hiring him. Uh, and then we were hired as, as architects and, and collaborated on, on the space, working with this notion of trying to create a kind of flexibility uh, without the neutrality of, of the black box. So um, uh, the project began um, as a sort of unit of, of, of program with the, the mixed use building and the theater. These are actually separate clients, but closely related. The, the developer of, the, of Boxcar 10 donated the land to the theater built the Boxcar 10 building as a way to support the theater and, and create a more vibrant neighborhood, a restaurant and bar, obviously, that you need for before and after theater performances. Um, but they're separate contracts, which was an interesting challenge um, from a construction standpoint because we had to um, work with two different clients to develop something that appears as one building. Um, so um, maybe a bit of a, a, a trite move here, but the, the box of the apartments is almost exactly the same proportion as, th as the theater. That wasn't necessarily intended, but it ended up that way. Um, so Boxcar 10 has a restaurant in the base and then a three-story apartment complex above. Um, here it is on the back side with the, the parking behind the theater. Um, and then the theater, uh, the sort of black box <coughs> notion of the center of the theater starts to form a sort of concentric, uh, in the interior of a concentric ring of program that starts with circulation in the booth and immediate services. And then the public space, access to the theater in the lobby, um, and, a, and a porch yard at area out here, connected to the green space. The inflections of the roof, I mean, everyone seems to feel that we were creating a metaphorical barn with this building to mimic the, the name of the company, but it was actually um, just a series of moves on the site, program pushing up where the, the theater is, rainwater drainage pushing down, and then a way of collecting rainwater at the back and a few other site moves generated the form of the building. Um, <coughs> and then in terms of the, the green space, we, um, we opted not to design the green space, but instead to hold a design competition to find a, a team of either artists or landscape architects or architects to, to design that space so that we would loosen up the, um, sort of our own control of the project and let it become uh, a more collaborative, open-ended um, project. We held a national competition. We had about 50 entries in the first phase of qualifications. Um, had a jury, selected five, gave them a stipend. They developed uh, projects. We had an, another jury uh, and publicly sort of presented those projects and then selected one that uh, was designed by El Dorado Architects in Kansas City with Urban Rain Design, which is a landscape firm in, in Portland. Um, I particularly liked it because they basically used our roof as a way of generating a form for the landscape, so the, the piece really held together. Some of the other projects were very separate, um, but this one had a dialogue with the project but still took its own, its own route. Um, they, they were really interested in combining all of the infrastructure for the project in this single bar, and then we talked about collecting rainwater from the roof and using that to irrigate the land, so we, we developed a, a very large gutter at the back of the building that took all the rainwater from the roof except for this point this one actually does slope back. Um, and then the, uh, the theater actually opens up to that space. So you can open up the back of the theater and then move out into that area uh, in, in, in that space there. So here's um, just the plan. You can see the sort of concentric rings of program. The all the back of house is back in this area. And then this is the restaurant and access to the apartments above. Um, property line there. One of the things we were trying to do is expand the sidewalk. So the sidewalk really becomes part of the building. Um, there was a bit of slope on the site, so that was a way of addressing that in some ways. There's the box of the apartments above, and then the roof form is almost sort of disregarding of, of the plan. Um, center line there, and then the landscape, again, sort of taking off of that form. Here's the roof, and then the apartments, which have spectacular views uh, over the city. Um, we tried to build a green roof, but we showed this to the city of Omaha, and the fire marshal said, green roofs, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of, and they wouldn't let us do it. Because obviously no one had built a green roof in Omaha before, and they thought it was a disaster, so they wouldn't approve it. Um, so we proposed artificial turf, which is uh, um, ended up getting DE'd out and might come back as a, as a second round, so that the people in the apartments have essentially a big backyard with a great view of the city. Um, 
Oddly enough, the, the, uh, this was a rezoned central business district, excuse me, central business district, so it has no height limit. And so we did explore the idea of doing a 10-story tower for this. Um, but obviously, you know, the minute you go above the, the height that we were at, it has to be a type one building and, and the costs go way, way up. So this is a wood frame structure, uh, type five is unrated, but um, so it was an interesting thing to think about, but the property values in Omaha are not, are, are not gonna justify uh, that kind of construction cost. Um, view from the north. Uh, we, uh, w working with um, the, the theater, uh, director, we were um, interested in trying to create a building that evolved over time. This was something she was really, uh, really felt strongly about. Um, and so, uh, you know, core 10 cladding became a, a way of, of developing a building that would, would visibly show its age. Uh, and we proposed s hanging rebar on the exterior, just a weldable rebar that would rust along with the building, um, but would create a sort of pattern of shadow at certain times of year. Um, but also sort of give away of the, the, the let the facade feel uh, some depth. The one of the problems with theater buildings is that they tend to be very blank. Um, then at the front, the rebar comes around and becomes the guardrail uh, in front of the, uh, the, the entry porch. Um, but it allows uh, artists to come in and do things. So this was actually done after construction where uh, an artist came in that the, uh, who's worked with them before and welded this uh, logo onto the building. We also commissioned four artists to do parts of the interior. So this was a brick um, ceramic artist who did these custom bricks in the, in the lobby. Um, the wood uh, salvaged timbers here and all of this salvaged wood was, was in the floor was produced by another artist. We commissioned uh, an artist from Kansas City to design uh, the public light fixtures. Um, and then in the theater itself, Again, these timbers by, uh, were salvaged by an artist. They're all from trees that were fall, had to be either cut down uh, for, for disease or were fallen by uh, storms in Omaha. And he salvaged those and they became uh, part of the structure in the, in the theater itself. Um, so that's the uh, rendering of the building and the section so you get a sense of how the theater relates to the park uh, out in the back. So really both the lobby and that, that space open up um, and one of the advantages of that is it allows us to create different ways of staging. So you have the, the standard proscenium uh, and then all these different ways that they can uh, set a show inside, outside, sort of alley, theater, environmental theater. And they've done all of these in the first uh, three years of, of uh, the first three seasons in this building. So it's a really interesting way of, of sort of breaking down the sort of normal location of of where theater occurs. It's a little dark to read, but that sort of shows the seating which was salvaged and then the columns and then the, uh, the sort of black interior, which is actually salvaged lumber um, painted black uh, and used as an acoustic baffle. So the conventional proscenium theater is seats, stage, and proscenium as a frame. And we proposed and built essentially a series of frames so that the proscenium essentially is still there, but breaks down and can be used uh, in many different ways. Um, and so sometimes they'll have a show where all the seating is on the stage and the seats are not used at all or the actors are in the seating and temporary seating is elsewhere. Um, more of a tectonic diagram, but just the sort of structural system for rigging uh, and then all those frames that open up into the, into the park area. Um, we commissioned another artist to build this door um, to open the theater up. It's a, a major bifold door. It's 32 feet wide, 12 feet tall. The general contractor wanted to charge $120,000 to build this. And we found an artist who said, oh, I'll build it for 12. Um, but we gave him 20 because we didn't want him to completely lose his shirt. And uh, he <coughs> built the door for about $22,000. Um, and it, it works really wonderfully uh, over this patio. And so during shows, they'll open up and they'll have, you know, suddenly the city is sort of part of the show. So one of the great things about this is that it makes the city a performer in and a character in the play potentially. Um, so the theater isn't just a sort of hermetic sealed box, but it's really a, a space within the city. Um, and then that's a view from, from the landscape uh, at night uh, with the up lighting on the wall. And um, I think I'll just end there. I think this is, a, a, you know, a, maybe back to uh, sort of the beginning, um, thinking about how this, this project evolved because of so many different factors that could not have been predicted at the 
at the outset, but it ends up being a culmination of all of our interests in um, you know, bespoke and, and sort of refined construction, but also loose and improvisational process procedures. Um, and a, a building that you know, keeps the identity of its, its inhabitants. The theater is sort of really sort of manifest in this, the, the company, um, but allows this, the institution to really interact with the city and with the, with the neighborhood and the climate of uh, you know, creative, creative folks in Omaha uh, with so many different artists engaged in the project. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> if anyone has questions. Well, it was, I mean, there was collaboration, but we, um, so we had five finalists who did design, submitted design proposals and presented them. Um, maybe three of them were sort of loose and open-ended and probably could have worked. Two of them were very much about themselves and they wouldn't really have interacted with the building very well and the, um, the jury was not very interested in those because they were more artwork sort of in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And um, as this competition proceeded, we, we really started to, Developed the notion of the landscape in engaging with the building, not just being an outdoor space. Because originally that was the idea, is that the, the, the building wouldn't open up to the landscape, it would just open up to the outdoor porch, and then the landscape would be a public park. But then we started to develop the idea of, uh, uh, of that being a participant in the building itself. And um, so once you know, we selected uh, El Dorado, we, we worked with them, and that was actually also a design build studio that was working on that with El Dorado. Uh, and they teach at Kansas State. Um, and so their students were in involved in that project as well. Yeah. I think there's a multi question. One is from just to give a variety of topics that you do, do you admire Berkeley Street? Or how do you handle working through? And the second question is, when you go into these kinds of projects for you, what's the, the sense for Yeah, well, the gentrification issue is, is clearly there. In the North Omaha project, um, when I talk about this with people outside the community, that's what I hear. When we talk about it with people in the community, they're extremely excited about it. Um, they, they just like people going to their, their community and engaging with it. And there's, some, there's a really great jazz club across the street. There's the Union for Contemporary Arts that I talked about. There's, there's some other um, facilities there that bring people in. But it's a neighborhood that for maybe the last 20 to 30 years has been essentially forgotten by the city and people think it's dangerous and it's not really, but um, you know, it has a lot of sort of uh, cliched um, you know, problems. But uh, the neighborhood's very interested. The, the gentrification issue is, is real. And this project, um, I'm talking about the North Omaha project, is um, it's intended to serve uh, artists in that community and, and around Omaha. I mean, it's not strictly for that neighborhood necessarily, but it's attainable housing, so it's not uh, it's not going to be uh, subsidized, um, you know, government subsidized housing. It'll be you know affordable rate uh, for for the city, which is pretty low. So it's a challenge to build the project and make a budget that makes sense. The developer um, is going to fundraise for, so they'll be. Um, you know, philanthropy behind building it, but they want it to operate and break even. So, um, you know, it has to, you know, you have to be able to rent apartments for maybe $700 a month and then um, be able to maintain the building for that cost. So the public spaces become a risk because, you know, who's paying for those and how are they being maintained? So that's one of the things we're working with them to try to figure out how that happens. One of the ideas that came out of some of the artists' uh, uh, workshops was that artists there, they really want to just work on their art, but they also, the most of them have, uh, people we've met with have, you know, other jobs as a source of income and they're not living off of their work. Um, but people were suggesting that maybe they could actually run the gallery or they could, you know, work, uh, you know, for the building taking care of the space and that might be maybe a barter trade with rent or something like that. So that's one of the things that we're working on with, uh, with the, uh, the developer and the Union for Contemporary Art, who are essentially the, the, the clients for that project. Um, the, uh, 
the Blue Barn Theater is in an area that really already is kind of gentrifying a little bit, but it's so close to downtown that um, it's become a, 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 a somewhat of a secondary cultural destination. Um, and there's a number of developers who've been working there. Um, I don't, I, I think most of the properties there were, were not really residential to begin with, so uh, I don't think there's uh, been displacements at this point. There's still a lot of affordable apartments. And the idea with Boxcar 10 was to make it affordable, but there's so many factors in that project that drove it uh, in an, another direction. Originally, it was going to be a 12-unit building and longer and lower. Uh, and then the, the our client said one day, oh, no, I just want to do three units, just, you know. And we told her, she still needs an elevator, but you're only going to spread the cost of an elevator over three units instead of 12, and suddenly the affordability kind of disappears. So um, so I think those apartments are not, I mean, they're for Omaha, they're, they're really expensive. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, uh, well, those are two questions. So the prison thing is, it's a workforce development program. And the way it works is that uh, a nonprofit state, like so we're at the University of Nebraska, is a you know, state university, um, can work directly with, with the inmate. The inmates get paid, so they're not, we're not talking you know, free labor, and they're getting paid for their time. Um, but they're getting trained in, in skills that they can apply uh, afterwards. And so they're already doing that kind of work. And what we were bringing is an opportunity to do m maybe more interesting things. Um, they actually ap approached us years before and wanted us to design furniture for them. And uh, we weren't really that interested in just doing prototype furniture for, for state office buildings. Because it, 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 you know, I, I don't think it would have really made a whole lot of sense. But it made sense to bring them in on these, these specialized projects. Um, but I, I, I mean, there's definitely uh, an awareness of the risks of, of abuse of that. Um, and it's a for-profit business can't do that. If a for-profit business wants to work with the prison shops, they have to actually set up a, a joint venture company, and then they have to pay uh, going wage for everything. So um, there's no way that a for-profit can come in there and start you know, uh, getting low-wage work out of, uh, of the uh, prison system. And it's a state system, so it's, it's run. They have a number of different shops in the different prisons. Um, in terms of the artists, um, they were we, we, we actually cut out a section of our design fee and gave each of the artists um, a, a piece of design fee to develop their projects. And then once they had the, the sort of, you know, the enough uh, development to be able to sort of work with the contractor and understand how it would interact with the building and then find out costs, they, a section of budget was given to them directly. So they were hired directly by the owner. Um, which meant the owner didn't have to pay the contractor's markup. Um, and so the contractor treated them as owner subcontractors, so they left you know, a substrate and then they got out of the way and let the artists come in and do their work. Um, so the difference in that door cost, I mean, the artist got paid, we actually gave him you know, about, um, you know, I think $10,000 more than he asked for because we thought he was probably underpricing it. Um, but the contractor was looking for a product, you know, from a catalog, and then trying to apply that to the building uh, with their usual markup and and so on and so forth. And so, by having a local artist build it, we're supporting the local artist, but we're also getting something that you, you, we couldn't afford to to build uh, in the normal uh, contracting process. And and so, one of the things that I think is interesting about that project is that we worked with Kiwit, which is a very large contracting company. They do mostly infrastructure work and large high-rise buildings and so on. This is a tiny, tiny project for them. I mean, it was both buildings together was about $6 million, and they, they usually don't do anything under $50 million. So um, they were doing it mainly for community um, engagement. But they um, they just could not handle things like this rebar detail. We, we showed them that, and they, they would come back to the next meeting with some catalog with some faux core 10 finish that you could spray on the building. And so it'll look kind of like it. <laughs> uh, and so we, uh, 
that was the one thing that we didn't outsource that was sort of that custom um, because it was so integrated to the building and, and uh, dealt with building performance. We, we didn't want to risk having someone else come in there and do that because it would affect the envelope of the building and you know that's a, a pretty critical part of the project. Uh, so we originally designed it as a panelized system. So the, the, the core 10 panels on the wall is a standard product that you know, is a, uh, a clipped um, sort of core 10 sheet <coughs> siding material. The rebar we originally designed as a series of frames that you could hang as sort of large panels on the building and sort of fabricate them off-site and then spring them in and crane them in. But there's a, it's not shown in this photograph, but just to the right here is a high-tension um, power line. And so to bring a crane in and do work under the power line would be cr really expensive because they have to use a very special crane and crane operator and the rules around building around a power line are pretty strict. So the contractor actually proposed just welding each bar on the building by itself. So we installed these, these brackets and then uh, they got some welders out there and the, they did a, a four foot test. And I think you probably heard more four letter words in an hour or two than you probably ever heard on the, con the construction site. But once they kind of got the hang of it, they would basically go, there's 3,000 pieces of rebar hanging off the building and they, they would basically hang a piece from the roof uh, the roof bracket, weld it on, let it just hang by gravity, mark it off, and then you know weld it at the bottom in the middle bracket. And, and they got into a groove, and then we just gave them a map. We had a, a grasshopper model that generated this, uh, this pattern, and, uh, and they just sort of banged it out in about a week. So um, it's, it's I think that issue of how contractors try to turn, I American contractors in particular, try to turn every uh, every design idea into a product that is, uh, you know, comes up from a catalog and installed on a building rather than a, an opportunity for fabrication or, or something else because they're, the way they, uh, they, um, they, they sort of handle liability, they want to push it off on the product and its warranty as opposed to doing something on their own. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, there's one more right back there. Yes. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, well I'm f I, I was born in, in Massachusetts and then uh, lived in Maine for a long time and lived in New Zealand. My, my during a, a previous president who was causing a lot of trouble in the 70s, my parents um, wanted to leave and we moved to New Zealand. They wanted to go as far away as you could and still speak English, so we moved to New Zealand for <laughs> about six years um, and then it came back and I finished high school in Maine and then uh, went to college in, on, in, in Massachusetts and then went to grad school in the West Coast <coughs> and got married to someone who was, you know, my wife who's, was teaching at a university in Omaha. So that plus a teaching job sort of made sense to make, make me move. So that's, that's sort of the life story in like <laughs> one minute. <laughs>